Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Most for hopefully, probably welcome back. I see the room just as full as this morning, which is great. So I am Glenn. I'm a product manager. For those of you who didn't see me earlier today, I'm a product manager on .NET. .NET platform team, which is everything that's not Maui or tooling, basically. And Scott Hunter um, used to work on .NET. Well, I still work on .NET. I've, I've been .NET forever. We've been about. trying to get rid of him for years now. I don't go away. <laughs> um, but now I build a bunch of the Azure platform. Um, and uh, Glenn and I work a lot to make sure the .NET and the Azure platform work well together. And yes. hopefully we're going to show some of that today. So Yeah, hopefully. Uh, if, if .NET and Azure do indeed work well together. So firstly, I guess there's one thing we can do. We can either start on web or you can finish your AOT demo. What do you want to do? Well, let's do the AOT stuff when we do Later. the cloud native stuff. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Let's start talking about web. How many of you all are like self-identify as web developers three times down here. Fantastic. How many of you are using Blazor of some form already? Okay, cool. How many want to use Blazor? Okay, that's better. Okay, cool. All right, not bad. So web development in, uh, I'm going to show a lot of Blazor stuff and a lot of kind of UI stuff, even though I personally spend much more time on doing backend dev than I do front end. But today, this slide, though, encompasses much more about what we've been doing in web development in general in .NET 8. We already talked about AOT earlier. We've been doing a whole bunch of work with metrics and like, getting telemetry out. There's a whole bunch of tooling around routing that you can see in Visual Studio, the ability to be able to colorize routes and things inside, the, inside your editor, which are going to be really good. A whole bunch of full, full stack web stuff that we're going to show most of today. We're doing a lot of work in APIs to try and make authentication easy because I asked lots of people what the one thing that they dreaded the most about starting the next API project was, and there was only one answer, and that was authentication. And so we're trying to make that a lot easier in .NET 8 as well. And we're going to show mostly full st the full stack column is mostly what our demos are going to be today, but know that there's a whole slew of other stuff, and I'll, we'll probably talk about APIs and that in Cloud Native, but, but this is, it's all web, right? The route tooling is cool. The what? The route tooling is cool too. The route tooling is cool, made by James Newton King of Newton Soft JSON fame. What is route tooling? Uh, it is the, you, it, what we gave you is in, when you're building an ASP.NET Core application, you have a little string that says, here's the route. You can have like curly brackets with like parameters coming in and stuff like that. The route tooling lets you start to see that. You can colorize it, split it out. So instead of it just being a string, you can actually like make sense of the components. You can hover over pieces and see what they are and it makes it feel like real code instead of a string. Not just a string. <laughs> it's really Today nice. it's a blank string and you don't know if it's right or wrong and now yeah. you'll actually be able to see in the tooling that you missed a brace or something like that. Indeed. And so let's talk about the best of the best of the best of web frameworks. Um, MVC, of course, is what I'm referring to. And uh, so in today's world, we have people doing kind of client-side stuff in .NET with Blazor. I have no idea why there's black squares on the screens. You'll have to forgive me. Um, <laughs> we have people doing kind of client-side rendering stuff today. They're doing Blazor. You're either Blazor, Blazor WASM, you're in the browser, Blazor server, kind of a hybrid. But you've got that spa look and feel where you have nice fluid interactions and you're moving things around in the page. Then you've got this server inside rendering world, MBC and Razor Pages. And Blazor and MBC and Razor Pages feel the same. They have the same language. They're kind of inspired by each other. They share stuff when they can, but they're kind of different, right? Well, let, let's, let's pause here. Server-side yeah. rendering. Right. Why, why, why is server-side rendering important? So I assume most of you that raise your hands as web developers, you're probably that. building single-page applications yeah, using absolutely. React or Angular, uh, you know, Blazor hopefully in the future. Yeah. Um, how many of you have gone to web pages and you, you do something and there's just a bleak, blank hole in the screen <laughs> and uh, you have no idea what's going on and, until yeah. it fills in? Uh, in many cases, that blank hole is like a form you're supposed to fill out. It's like, why did I wait for uh, yeah, a, a, a client-side rendered form when that's the static content anyway? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so server-side rendering is where you, on the server, you do a request or the browser does a request. The server generates, basically does the entire, all the work to generate what the HTML should be. And it sends all of that HTML back to the browser and then the browser just displays it, it just renders it. 
right? Well, it, it weirdly it's called server-side rendering. It does all the work on the server except for drawing the pixels, and then the drawing the pixels happens on the client in the browser, and that entire stream of HTML is sent back. As opposed to client-side, where you do a bunch of logic, a bunch of work in the browser as well. You like make HTTP requests, you do validation logic, you do things like that in the browser. And that's kind of the two worlds. And it's slower because it's making requests back to the server. Well, it's, yeah, it's running code. Frequently slower to load because you have to have a payload, the, the logic has to load into the browser. It often feels faster once that's there because you're moving things around inside the browser without going back to the server. Um, but and, uh, and it scales really well because once the logic is downloaded, then you don't have anything going back to the server, right? But uh, yeah, that's initial load time can be problematic. You're also inside a browser sandbox when you're doing the logic. You need to have an API to be able to do an API call to talk to the database. It's just, it's just they're just different, right? There's not no strength. And my, my, big, my favorite example here is Amazon. If you yeah. go to Amazon.com, one of the biggest shopping sites in the world, it's server rendered and then it's a spa after it's server rendered. Yeah. And so we want to enable you to do the same thing. With Blazor. And so the idea here is that we can mix these two worlds so you can do, get the best of server-side rendering, really fast load speeds, do stuff on the server where it makes sense. And as soon as it makes sense for you to do something in the client, you can switch over to doing something in the compliant at a very fine grain level or as, as you need, basically. So you can start server, and then go client as needed or vice versa or whatever, however you want to do it. And we want to be able to just effectively build a, seam, a single seamless stack for doing any form of server-side rendering or client-side rendering in .NET without having those kind of siloed different app models. And they'll all use the same, you know, Razor syntax and our, stuff like our, that. Our, our long-term goal would be there's only one type of, you, you build a web app. Yeah. And the web app just does all these things. You don't choose between MVC or Razor pages or Blazor. You just go and say, I want to build a web app. Right. So here's a bunch of the features that I'm going to go and show, and let's um, let's like show some of this because talk is cheap. So I have this application here. Uh, um, it, this is a recipe app, so you can browse around. I can like click on recipes. I can add some star ratings. I can like search for things. I could search for whiskey because it's about that time, and then uh, <laughs> things like that, right? I could come down and um, I don't remember drinking this. Could be my rating. I could give it a five stars. Is this a server page or a client page? And then, uh, yeah, this, so this is the way the app looks and feels. Now, this is completely server rendered. And you can tell, if you're paying attention, that it's completely server rendered. If I go over here and I open up DevTools, then as I navigate around, you can see it just loading, you can see all of the assets downloaded like a traditional web page, you know, as the web should have been back when it was pure and nice. Um, the, uh, you can see it downloading that, there's no, uh, was, there's no WebSocket connections, there's no WASM, it's just HTML and CSS and images. And every time I click a button, it's doing form posts and things like that. So you notice that there's a few like, but there is a, it's, so the benefit of this, super duper scalable. Like you can like scale out infinitely. This thing is can can, can scale really well, right? And it's um, and it's fairly efficient. Some deficiencies though. You notice as I click around, sometimes it kind of pauses. And if you notice when I did that review of the of the whiskey, the page like refreshed and it jumped all the way back. And that's because every one of these clicks is a post back to the server because this was how server rendering ends up working. You get that super fast startup speed, but every time I click something, it goes back to the server, server generates the next set of HTML, that comes back down to the client, right? So the obvious answer here is we should use JavaScript, right? Natalia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. see, JavaScript. Um, or I have some other things. So the answer is JavaScript, but what if, see this line of code here? So, just a little tour around this page, you'll notice index.razor, right? So this is a Blazor component that you can navigate to. So the model for building these server rendered or client rendered pages is the Blazor component model. And you just build Razor components and you put them together, you compose those together as you need. And if you put page at the front, it's navigable, if you don't, it's don't, and, um, every, and away you go. So there's no distinction between any of these things, it's one seamless whole. So if you're familiar with Blazor uh, at all already, then, um, then uh, with Blazor at all already, then this will be super familiar. If not, it's still Razor, so the language is still the same, it's gonna be okay.
So what I've done here is I've added this script reference to the Blazor United JavaScript framework. So I've added reference to Blazor in my main, um, and it's a standard like JavaScript reference to my uh, main layout page here. And then I'm going to run build, and I'll explain why dash f later for those of you who really want to know. And then my machine's a little bit slow for some reason lately, so this takes a little while to build on my machine. I'm also running this off of like a off of a like early alpha preview branch of the thing, as all good demos should be. Um, so this now, what did that do? That magic JavaScript reference. Well, it's still, you know, it's still server rendered. It's still server side rendering. It's still doing all the stuff, right? But you see the pause there. But if we go down here and we say, you don't make friends with you don't make friends with fruit, right? One star. I click submit. Whoop! Didn't work. Wouldn't work. Didn't work. Let's refresh that. Do I have uh, Blazor loaded? There we go. So what happens here, or what's supposed to happen here, and what has happened the 3,000 times that I've done this demo before, is when you do this and you click submit, it, uh, the JavaScript does a DOM manipulation, and it did not. Probably, look, look, look. <laughs> what, what are you doing, you know? You're supposed to save me from that. Okay. All right, let's try that again. Should have had a video, shouldn't I, Natalia? <laughs> um, okay, so what this JavaScript does is, when I, once this builds and loads again, when I go and add the next star rating, it just appears. But it's still a full server rendered page. What's happening is, the post is going back to the server, it's coming back, and then that reference that we added that starts to add Blazor, just does really smart DOM manipulation to modify just the little bit of the page that they need and make sure you stay where you are. So now all of your navigation starts to feel really smooth, as if it was a, as if it was a fully client-side um, client application. I can start doing things in here, right? I can start adding stuff. Look at that! There you go. Magic, right? So I can now start doing things in here. That felt like a spa. Right? That didn't feel like doing a fully server, but this is still a fully server rendered app. So I haven't paid any of the cost of building, of downloading a full, like all the logic of my application or anything into here. All of my backend code can just access the database and stuff if I want. I don't need an API layer. So that's nice. I've started to merge worlds, right? So let's fix our other problem. Our other problem is when we were clicking around, sometimes it was slow, right? And the reason it was slow is I have this very, very hard-working database query right here. See it? The delay database. Yes, it's yeah. very good. Very fast. And so, for some reason, my database has gotten a little bit slower lately. Make it slower. Like that. And then, uh, the, what, that, what, that represent, what that means is every time the index page loads, it takes at least two seconds to come back, because that's how long, for some reason, my database queries are taking. And then, uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back here and I'm going to uncomment this attribute, this stream rendering true. And what this is going to do is it's going to basic, this is still fully server rendered, but it's going to stream the response back. So on the client, I'm, what, I'm, what you're going to see is if recipes is null, display loading recipes, and then over the as the request streams back, once all the data comes back, it'll switch over, we'll just manipulate the DOM to switch over to this list, all using a normal request and response, still without loading any logic into the browser. Really. Well, there is logic in the browser, obviously. Very None of yours. <laughs> right? Um, so, that's what's going to happen. And I should have hit run whilst I was making that very uh, entertaining discussion of what's going to happen. <laughs> um, so, what this should, what we should, you could put this, you could put your like spinny animated GIF in here or like whatever the, whatever the thing is, the experience you want. And it does it via, as we said, if recipes is null, and then we assign recipes on our uh, part, on our initialization. So everyone understands, hopefully, if you understand how that works. But that's, um, that's how our logic is going to be. And so if we try this out now, we come over here, we go home. Look at that, loading recipes. Yes. It's always going to take two seconds, because that's how long it takes for my database query to run. But now I haven't degraded my user experience by just having it sit there and pause and hang. And I've still 
not switch this over out of server rendering. I still have Blazor really, really fast load times. I'm just selectively sprinkling a little bit of Blazor magic here and there in order to be able to get more of the things that you get out of a full spa as needed instead of the whole thing, right? Because my whole spa framework, building my whole app in React so that I could do validation in a form seems like overkill. And you'll notice even if I come in here and I just do this, I still have full form validation. I still have all of this stuff happening. It still works, right? So we fix those bugs. But not everything is, hey, not everything is like that. This form has a little bit of logic. So you can add lists of ingredients. Now, I don't really want to submit this entire form all the way back to the server every time I add a new ingredient. This feels like a case where I do want logic in the browser, right? OK, time to switch frameworks, obviously. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to cancel this. I'm going to have to go learn JavaScript, start a React app, or switch over to Blazor Client, right, Hunter? Or we could rewrite the entire app in Blazor Client. You're right. We could, right. That's a bad idea. Or I could add this attribute. Is that okay if I do that instead? Yeah? Okay. This attribute, now, this attribute affects this just this Razor component. But I could also apply it to just this control if I wanted to, such that only that one instance of that Razor component is, switched, is using this new render mode. But I am doing it to the entire page for now, putting it at the top. So what this does is this page now operates the same as Blazor server. This is now a Blazor server page, but only this page. Everything else is still the same, right? All this stuff still works exactly the same as I just described. Um, if so I, that's kind of cool. I can describe, part of my app can be server side, part of my app can be spa, yeah. all in the same app without making a crazy right. hybrid app. So for the eagle-eyed amongst you, when I click on this submit page now, look at that. What's that? It was a WebSocket. That, my friends, is a WebSocket connection. And as a web, so just when I go to this page, I get the WebSocket connection because now, and now I can come down here and I can do 350 grams of flour and I can click add and I have a full like spa type experience over this persistent WebSocket connection. Okay, seems pretty cool, right? But Natalia loves WASM, I know. And she's been talking about it all week, all conference. <laughs> and so she definitely wants to see some logic running in the browser more. So instead, we're gonna, so we're gonna do this. We're gonna say WebAssembly. And then I'm gonna run it again. Is anybody gonna guess on what that does? Given the trajectory of this talk. <laughs> I so that, now- I think well, that's gonna run the browser, Glenn. So now what's gonna happen is that page, instead of having a WebSocket connection when I browse to it, that whole page's logic is now going to be low, that a WASM module will now be downloaded to the browser and it will run in the browser solely. And as I do, when I, and it'll only go back to the server when I click post. And Talia's already started clapping. I see you. This is good to see. So now, if I uh, go back to my page and I come back to submit page and I go F12 and I go WASM, I will start to see WASM stuff get loaded. And as I, um, as I navigate around, you look, look at that. So now you'll start to see all of .NET loaded in the browser and you'll start seeing WASM modules appear because you are running now in full client mode, right? Um, so now I have, so I've sprinkled this all throughout the application and then as needed, just as I've decided I need that logic or where in my app I've needed it. So when I go to the complex form, it does the WASM download then and the rest of my application is super fast and server render whenever it can be. And what about that? Auto, auto mode. So in auto mode, what happens is you run the application, it download, it starts off fast. It does the Blazor, was, the Blazor server WebSocket connection, which gives, which the web, when you use Blazor server, you have a small first payload and it does a WebSocket connection back to the server in order to do the spa-like experience. Whilst that's happening, the WASM module for the app downloads to the client. Once the WASM module is there, it uses that instead. And you never even see the difference when you're the client browsing around. 
And if the WASM module's already there because you browsed this page before, it just loads it immediately and you never don't go through that. So that this means I never pay that cost of... So you've never paid that. I never pay the cost of having the WASM boot up because yeah. basically the, t t the text saying, I'm going to render server side first yeah, and exactly. then and so in the background, this, I'm going to load WASM for you. Yeah, so in this case, because of the way I've done this demo flow, the WASM's already there, so my page just loads. And so now you have this magic moment where you get the ability to have a full SPA framework with, you have a full SPA experience, it is running as WASM inside the browser without the downside of having your customers wait for the WASM module to download because they don't have to because it does the, that kind of hybrid approach by selecting auto mode. So I could, I could put my amazon.com website in auto mode, I would get a server side rendered page the first time, and then I would get spa after that. Exactly. Does that seem good? And then... Without writing code to do that. That's the yeah. hard... It's that, the, and then as, you, as we saw, you can also then choose completely fine-grained as to which parts of your application have this logic. You go, as, you go all the way down to just this component on the page works that way, this full page, my whole application. You just choose the bits that make sense the most for you. You choose, your, you choose the, the stuff, right? There are frequently pages in your app that should just be server-rendered and other pages that should not be. And you can now choose without having to mix and match kind of different paradigms because now one model, one paradigm, one way of building the app, and you just make a choice very simply via an attribute. And we're seeing common JavaScript frameworks do the same thing, Glenn, where they're yeah. actually now, we've come full circle in the web, we started on the server, we went all client, and now even, even things like Next.js are actually doing server rendering as well. So this Indeed. is the... And I pressed the wrong command to bring back the slides. So. Um, in the um, in the video in this deck, when if you just want to download it, I have a video of Dan Roth doing the exact same demo that I just done, and that's our web section. All right, um, full stack web application development. You choosing how much you want of anything at any given time. All right, and you write the app without even knowing. You just write a web app. Yeah, you, you don't you don't app. have to worry about is it client, is it server, is it both. You right. just write the web app as a as a as a plain web app and then you, you define how you want it to run. Yeah, all right, cool. We think that's pretty cool. We think that's a, that's a big advancement. So, uh, and, and I think our long-term is just to, as I said, hopefully we'll just have in the future at some point, maybe .NET 9 or 10, they'll just be web app. Yeah, and you sure. can build a web app in .NET and choose what, which, what you want. If you want yeah. server or client or both. Absolutely. Uh, you know, in the app. Yeah. That's our hope. All right, so moving on to cloud and native. Uh, firstly, um, this is a kind of oldish. This is a this is from a I guess this is a .NET 7 in thing. .NET 7. This is the first instance of us though being being uh, one of the things we associate with Cloud Native is you're probably running in containers, you're probably running on Linux. So this is the beginning of us saying, well, look, we work just as well as any other anything else on there. Don't, uh, just apt install Linux and you get .NET part of our deal, a big deal with Ubuntu. But getting onto more Cloud Native stuff, like more real Cloud Native stuff. We did a bunch of work recently to not just be in the box in Ubuntu, but work with, on a, worked with Ubuntu for, to create chiseled, to .NET chiseled images. And chiseled images are distroless, faster to pull and start, more secure because, well, I don't know, my security guy would say it's not more secure. Less surface area because there are less things installed in the image because I cut that right down in order to get the file size down. Um, and we are doing work to make non make it so by default your web apps are not running as root inside the container even to give you a little yeah, bit. You get better. the size like you get the size benefit because we a bunch of stuff is removed. removed yeah. But really for me in, in the security aspect of me, I love the the idea that there is no shell, there is no way to get to a shell. Yeah. Uh, there is no package manager. Yeah. Uh, there is no there you know there is no you can't you don't have an admin user. We're basically yeah. taking away all the things that shouldn't be there anyways. Yeah. Uh, this is the future of containers for most of our applications, I think. It was is a this big, and it was a big collaboration with, uh, with Ubuntu to make that happen. Um, so yeah, and then the other one, um, we mentioned this earlier, uh, the ability to publish a container image natively. So if you type this command for your .NET 7 or 8 application, it gets better in 8, um, you just get a Docker container without a Docker file, without even Docker running on your machine. You can get a Docker image. You don't even have to have Docker desktop. This, this is important because if you want to put Docker on your machine, you're likely going to have to install WSL or Hyper-V. You're going to put Docker desktop on your machine or Container yeah, D or something a, else. And then this is also just going to make your builds faster because we've removed all those steps. 
Yeah, we had a lot of people complain that the acquisition of Docker was just slowing them down. They really wanted something easier for us. So, do you want? To, this is a pet topic of yours. Do you want to take this? I'll take a little bit of this. I uh, I call this word vomit. Um, yeah. Uh, this is this is what the uh, Cloud Native Foundation calls a, a, what yeah. Cloud Native is, and, yeah. and what's funny is when I talk to customers, they like move their like 20-year-old .NET app to the cloud, we're, and we're Cloud Native now. Um, I think the real thing that we care about, and this is something that, that we're we don't have it all today, but we're thinking about it right now, is um, we think of this as microservices and containers, and and you can do that with .NET today, but really there's words in here like scalable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to build a, a proper scalable application, horizontally scalable application, you want to have queues. So your front end web, web process will actually put something in a queue and something in the back end will actually pull it out and take an action on that. Um, and you can do this in .NET today, but you're going to write it all yourself. Um, and uh, we want to make that better. And that's something that we'll hopefully this year show some improvements will, in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think another part of this is um, as you take a, you know, I'll give you a classic example. If you take a, 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 an existing ASP.NET application and you put it in Azure Container Apps and scale it up, it'll crash. Um, and uh, we want to go make sure that we solve those types of problems. It crashes because if you of session. data protection. Well, actually, yeah, data, data protection. Yeah. We have an encrypted key to make sure stuff coming from client to server is, yeah. is actually uh, from the right client. Yeah. Um, and that key needs to be shared and uh, we need to solve those problems. And then the other big part here is observability. Um, uh, my favorite example of this is a couple of years ago, um, the ASP, not the ASP, the .NET website was crashing. And I was talking to Damien Edwards and David Fowler on the team. Um, and we had the app scaled up to a couple of instances and we couldn't figure out which instance was crashing. They weren't all crashing. Mm -hmm. And so how do we build the observability tech into .NET so you can actually see the request come from the, the client to the back end and see exactly which backend it came to. You, we want to show you those entire flows and make that data available yeah. to you. And so that needs to be plumbed into the tech yeah. all the way from the bottom. So there's a bunch of this stuff that the .NET team can't impact if you're using service meshes and such. But resilient, writing resilient and observable services that are distributed that trivially easily and by default, that is something we can absolutely help you with. That's a big one too, resiliency. So yeah. you know, when you're on-prem, you got machines with cables right between them, nothing's going to happen. And you're in the cloud, the cloud wobbles. It doesn't go down in many cases, but it does wobble. And so what might be five milliseconds one time could be 3,000 milliseconds the next time. And .NET has all the capabilities to actually do that resiliency for you. It's just not turned on by default. And, and we need to help you turn that stuff on by default. .NET, the ecosystem, at least. Yeah, so .NET, True. so one of the things that we did this last year is, or for a while, we do this constantly, actually. But in the instance, the stuff from about to talk to was in .NET 8 and in the last year. But one of the things about .NET is that we constantly do this circle. And so you saw this earlier today if you watched the keynote where we had all of the different internal teams. They all had like 60% CPU improvements and so on and so forth, right? Um, all resulting in money savings for Microsoft as we constantly improve the tech. But also, when you've got a team who sits, you know, the building across the street, who are building something like the team's backend with like 300 million concurrent users or something, things like that to that scale, they know a lot about how your technology <laughs> will, falls over or doesn't fall over. And so we then go learn as much as we can from them, or they call us just yelling and screaming, and we improve .NET. We merge it into our public source, open source repos. You all then just get the benefit of the fact that we fix the things for those. And so over the, within .NET 8, what we found was a few collections internally of packages that people were using that were basically filling gaps for cloud native people. If, for, they were basically building high scale cloud services with .NET. We don't know it wasn't good enough out of the box. They built their own kind of mini frameworks on top. And so we went and looked at all of those. We pulled a bunch of common th components out and started moving them into um, the same, into the open, because they were all private internal repos. So these all started to become open source. We, the .NET team took the burden of taking their code, making sure it was the way we would do it, making it public, documenting it, stuff like that. Right? So now we have this partnership with these internal teams. And so what that looks like is Microsoft Extensions Resilience and HTTP Resilience are packages that have a lot of functionality for you to be able to do resilient HTTP communication between two services. That also includes us helping the Poly team rewrite Poly. 
So what is, what is Poly, Gwen? Poly is a, it's Poly is for policies. So it's, if you haven't used Poly, it's an open source library created by some people in the community. And it lets, does, has things like retry policies and circuit breakers and things like that to be able to, to be able to do resiliency across some arbitrary thing. We think we can make it about 10 times faster in the next version after a bunch of the Microsoft engineers who were using it then started to work with the Poly people to be able to do PRs. So what you should be doing is making an HPT client factory, yeah. putting a, a, an HP client in there with Poly attached to it, and then your app will just use yes. the, the, the client from there across the application, and you get this benefit and for your Yeah, your and when you grab these resiliency packages and you read the docs about them, that'll all become a lot easier and a lot more obvious, and you'll be able to see what to do. But yes, if you haven't used, if you're not using like HTTP client factory and Poly to make HTTP requests, then you've got a very kind of crude retry pattern. And part of this resiliency will also, there's more features than just Poly. It's not just Poly. There's a bunch of stuff in these packages. Um, Poly is the easy thing to talk about. And they also come with like kind of default policies that we found worked well that you could start with and then you could start to tweak yourself, right? We also have some stuff for compliance and log redaction. So we had a lot of people struggling with how they like pull some data out of the log messages on the back end. So we started to do some work there. And we've done a lot of work to make sure telemetry and observe, like to make the apps observable by putting all of our stuff, to make sure that all of our stuff logged. And so what we mean by observability is we have these three pillars of logs, metrics, and distributed traces. And so all of these exist and work, and they have for some time in .NET. We've done a lot of work to make it better and include more stuff in the last release, but these are the three things we mean when we're under the banner of observability for Cloud Native. And what this looks like for you, if you're not in the, in the um, Cloud Native like space, there's a bunch of technologies that people think of as Cloud Native. And so Prometheus and Grafana is a way in the, from the CNCF to be able to get a bunch of telemetry out of your app and get it and put Grafana renders that as a dashboard. So you get cool, pretty like dashboards. Right? Like, would you, what, like would you like to know how many requests per second your yeah, APIs are doing? Yeah, how many requests doing... per second, how many errors per blah, like all the like, mono, like dashboard on the wall that looks cool and keeps the bosses happy, right? That type of thing. Um, then for distributed trade, now you might also plug in something like App Insights, like we have down the bottom, and then things like those sorts of tools tend to combine all these things into their own place. So I'm trying to show the, both the generic like CNCF cloud native ones, but there's also a bunch of other ones like App Insights that you can use here. If you're using App Insights, it's cool. For distributed tracing, what distributed tracing is, is if you've got a service A that talks to service B that talks to service C, and it's slow, where is it slow? Which bit? And if you want to know that, then you want distributed tracing. So distributing tracing gives you a trace of a request as it goes through your whole system and you can see it end to end. And you can see which bits are fast, which bits are slow, where the request is going. And you can get that with Jaeger and Zipkin and that family of CNCF products. You can see some of those things in App Insights and Friends as well. And that's where you want distributed tracing. And then logs is logs. You get the text logs, you search them, you do, you do your thing, right? Um, this is how we view the observability in the cloud native space for all of our people. And you're gonna see more and more examples and sample apps and work documentation on how to set up both of the generic versions of the kind of Prometheus Grafana ones of these, as well as those kind of vendor APIM tools like, uh, like App Insights coming from us. And uh, we even have a few big demos of all of that stuff working. Um, do you want to show that demo now? Or do... a, why don't we just do demos for the rest of the yeah. time and just right. do a couple things? No more slides. Sounds good to me. Here you go. Nothing could possibly go wrong switching laptops. Nothing. Also, my, present, my deck today is not saved, and I have an update for PowerPoint that I refuse to install until after this talk, which is the best way to do a talk. So I just wanted to go back to the, uh, the demo that we did earlier Let's, um, so the demo we had earlier was basically, I am not on the screen, am I? You are not. Why don't you plug into this thing again? Oh, there we go. Just jiggle the cable. Nothing went wrong, you saw nothing. <laughs> and, and so I want to show like the first part of, of what we talked about in, in uh, on some of the metrics. How do you add metrics in this? And, and I want to show some of the pros and cons. So the app that we showed earlier that we took and made it AOT and made it non-AOT. Yeah. Um, if, I, if, I, if you look at all my program CSs, they're going to have some kind of like map observability. Yeah. Map observability. So, yeah, to make this stuff work, you log to iLogger and you use the metrics, you use the .NET types for logs and metrics and friends. 
and the libraries use those types, and you add exporters in the program that push that to where you need it to go. You, nowhere in, you don't spread this knowledge out throughout your code. There's a single place you say, I'm using Zipkin here, and then we make sure that all that stuff flows the right way. So you should almost never have to think about the fact that this thing is happening via like Zipkin or that this is Zipkin or this is Prometheus or whatever. You should just be able to think about this is the dashboard, and when I do logger.log, it goes to the right place, and when I have metrics, they go to the right places. Okay. And so here's that same Contoso app we were running earlier, um, except this time, you know, if I go back to my VS code, I do have, uh, under my containers, I do have a Grafana container, and I opened that up and went to the, the main page of that, and here it is, um, and I'm going to look at the default ASP.NET Core dashboard, um, and now I can start seeing stuff that's happening in my app yeah. real time. And so I should be able to go over here and yep. refresh the page a whole bunch of times, that dashboard uh, should appear in the Grafana marketplace at some point if you want to play with it. Grafana has like a marketplace of dashboards. So that exact dashboard, I believe, we're going to publish. But if not, it's not that hard to put together. It's kind of a fully customizable. And so you can see the request per seconds has been bouncing around a little bit as I, as I go back and, yeah. and uh, hit the application. But our goal, is, as Glenn was saying earlier, with this whole cloud native push, is to literally go make it where all this information is easily available to you when you're with your running application. Today, you probably write your own code to go build dashboards and generate this kind of stuff. We want to give you default dashboards. Yeah. We want to write you the code for you. And we, want to, and we want to make sure that .NET integrates seamlessly. If you're doing cloud native apps, you need to integrate seamlessly with the cloud native ecosystem. And this, that's what this means, right? So we're making sure that's possible. You can see I can look here and see some requests are fast and some are slow. Yeah. There's just rich, rich data in here as well. So uh, yeah. Um, and we're going to make that seamless. That's, that, to me, is the, is the big deal here, is we're trying to make this as seamless as possible. Yep. Um, so um, I'll go back to uh, VS Code one final time. Um, and I'm going to switch back to the AOT branch. One of the things we didn't show this morning is how, um, the, AOT things. how the AOT thing works. So it's very hard to do. When, when, when I made the app AOT, what did I actually what did I change? When I switched to the AOT branch, what actually happened in the app uh, to do that? Let's go back to the code. And I will just do a simple, let's do find in folder, and I will search for AOT. Um, and what you're going to see here is all I've done in my application is basically say publish AOT is true. Yeah. And so um, that means when you publish the application, you get the AOT version of the application. Yeah. Um, I believe you can do this from command line as well without yeah. actually putting the attribute in the, in the, in the project file as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's how simple it is to uh, AOTFI your application. We yeah. didn't talk this morning either about, um, we do have things that you can use, tools that will tell you if stuff is AOT aware. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the Docker default target OS there is part of that thing we talked about earlier where you can generate Docker images by natively from the CS project as well. Yes, so even though I'm on a Mac or a Windows machine, You're get a Linux. Uh, we'll make a, a Linux container for you automatically. And so that's kind of the, the AOT stuff that we've done. Um, I want to shift around, and uh, I'll just quit this instance of VS Code, and uh, I'll jump out here. Let's make this bigger. Um, something else we just shipped is we shipped uh, this, the C Sharp Dev Kit. Yeah, have any of you, who, who here has not heard of C Sharp Dev Kit? Who has heard? Or who has heard? Everybody should put your hand up now, because now you put your hand up last time. What are you doing? Uh, so there's a bunch of people shaking their head, though, even though they didn't put their hand up. They're not keen of putting their hands up around here, Hunter. So definitely some people have never heard of DevKit before. Yep, I don't think so. Um, so, so here is... Um, here we... I did that wrong. <laughs> How about I go into the test one folder? There we go. Uh, and now we're in here, and obviously there's no code here. Mm. Um, but if I go look at my extensions, um, you're going to see some new stuff here. There's, there's this uh, C-sharp extension. There's the C-sharp dev kit extension. Uh, there's the .NET install tool for extension authors. Yeah. Um, what, that, what, that, this, what this does is basically this is a tool that makes it where any plugin for VS Code that, that uses .NET as, it, in, as its coding language, we manage the .NETs that are installed for VS Code because obviously... Uh, we're doing that for DevKit. So what, what the DevKit is, is we've taken... Uh, wow, we update this thing all the time. It's already asking for a refresh again. Yeah. Um, what we've done is we've, we've taken the code from Visual Studio. 
Um, the same code that you would use that, that does all the IntelliSense, that does all the stuff in Visual Studio, and we've now hooked that up uh, into VS Code. Yeah. And the idea is to give you a much better .NET experience in VS Code. So now we understand uh, what solutions are, uh, yep. We understand what projects are yeah. um, and all those kinds of you can, intricacies. And you can get, so you can get all of this just by installing the C Sharp Dev Kit and it does its thing. So if you think VS Code just needs a bit, a little bit more Visual Studio in it, a little bit of code lens, a little bit of more hot fixes, code fixes, analyzers, stuff like that, install C Sharp Dev Kit and you'll get a much more Visual, you're much more of the functionality of Visual Studio in Visual Studio Code. And so now you can see if I go up here, I have .NET New Project. Uh, that was never there before. Mm -hmm. um, I can select that. And now I get the same list of, of project types I would have in Visual Studio yeah. uh, to build applications. I can choose something like a uh, console application here. And it's going to say, what do you want to call it? That's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to put it in this folder? Uh, that looks fine to me as well. And uh, now you're going to get something new here. Let's let it, let it build up here. And uh, for, for the, you know, if you've been using VS Code with .NET, you get this view up here that I see at the top all the time. You get this VS Code folder with some weird settings. Uh, you've got your console application. Uh, you've got the bin folder, the object folder, which you don't really care about if you're using Visual Studio. You don't really see these things unless you show all files. Hmm. Um, you mean but, I'm not supposed to care about the obs folder? Blasphemy. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't go there very often, do you? <laughs> um, but now I have uh, this new view which is the Solution Explorer. Yeah. And so now, uh, the same kind of things you're, gonna, you're used to seeing probably in Visual Studio, you're gonna start seeing in Visual Studio Code. So um, those folders are now gone, and uh, my dependencies now shows up. I can see the analyzers that are attached to the project. Um, I can see what framework um, I'm targeting here. Um, if I add packages, you'll see the packages there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to give you that, that Visual Studio kind of feel uh, inside of VS Code. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll show one more example of this. I'm going to drop out of here and uh, we'll go back to, uh, to the test folder. Mm -hmm. I was playing with this earlier today. Um, and this is a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is an application that's got uh, multiple apps. It's got a class library. Um, it's got a console application. Uh, you can see that the console application knows that it points to the class library. You're basically seeing that full Visual Studio yeah. style Visual thing Studio here. Solution Explorer. Yeah. If I go into my code, um, it flashed. Maybe it'll come back in a second here. Let's see if it'll, I can make it come back. Uh, you're going to start seeing the same light bulbs that you would see uh, inside of Visual Studio. Yep. Come on, give me the, there we go. Um, so for example, here's a light bulb. If I want to convert uh, my namespaces to blocks. You the, so this is using a new C-sharp feature where we don't put the curly brace uh, on the names, namespace. Yeah. But if I want to put it back that way, I can say, hey, go make that. Um, and it'll go put the braces in for me. If I want to go take that back away, I should have the option to go take it back away. And so um, all the light bulbs and all the IntelliSense features that you would have in Visual Studio are now in Visual Studio code. And even more important, I think for, for Glenn and I, yeah. um, this also... Uh, means that we're sharing the code. So if we fix a bug in Visual Studio, you're going to see the same changes in VS Code yep. uh, as well. And it's not going to be everything. We don't expect you want all of Visual Studio in Visual Studio Code. And uh, we think, and there's a, but there is what was just shown, plus like a bunch of I got of one more. You're going to do one more? Okay. <laughs> so, so like Glenn, um, I have a laptop which I'm allowed to destroy. And this is the uh, destroyed laptop. Hmm. Um, I... Uh, will not um, put the crazy stuff on my big production laptop. So let's see if this <laughs> yes. will share the screen. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, let's try the plug and unplug again. Um, yeah, so there'll be a, there's a bunch of testing support that's in there as ah. well. If you go, there's a, some good blog posts about DevKit. You should check it out. Like if you've been using Visual Studio Code or you've wanted to use Visual Studio Code, but it wasn't quite, didn't have quite enough, refactoring was the thing I always missed, then uh, Check it out, install it, give it a crack. It's still in preview. It only came out a little while ago. Log bugs, and hopefully it'll be what you wanted, always wanted. Here's, here's the final uh, of these, and this is using an extension we have not... Notice it's complaining I don't have an Android SDK. Yeah. Um, and that's because I am using a new extension as well. If I look over here, 
Um, I've got the .NET MAUI extension in VS Code, and so yeah. for the first time ever, uh, you can build client apps in VS Code as well. And so I should be able to go up here and say run, start debugging. Um, it's going to go build my MAUI application. Wow. Lots of stuff happens, and a MAUI app. MAUI, right VS Code. yes. Um, and hit my breakpoint. I have a breakpoint running in there every time the counter is, counter is clicked. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who have been doing MAUI and you've been using VS Code VS for Mac or something like that, you'll now be able to start using Visual Studio Code instead um, and things like that. So, so this should be very, very good. As MAUI gets better and better as it is in .NET 8, it's starting to get, starting to get very good. And this extension is um, going to ship in a few weeks. We're, st we're still working out the bugs. Like the reason I said this is a test laptop, it took the, the team at Microsoft, uh, they an hour and a half to get it working on my machine uh, on a phone call. So uh, it's a little rough, the Maui stuff is, but it, uh, we'll get there in the next yeah. week or two. And we are, oh yeah, I need to do this too. Thank you. See, computers, that were a mistake. Okay. So uh, that's all, and we are at time, which is good. Unless, unless, so I'll play a push run through quickly with VS Dev Kit, Solution Explorer. AI assistance, uh, test explorer integration, which we didn't show you, but it exists in there as well. Uh, then we showed some Maui stuff. The slides we didn't show you for Maui were just saying Maui's great, and Maui's getting better and better. It's getting adopted by a bunch of people. If you're worried about that, here's some people's names. Um, so, oh, this we're is at the best time. demo. Do you, you want to see this one? So let me tell you one of my complaints about .NET. Um, when I first started learning how to run, write C++ and Java, I could just I didn't have to create project files. I just created a, a .java file, and I told Java to run the Java file. If Java space test.java, and it would run the file. You know, .NET still feels complicated if you're brand new. We're, one of the things you'll hear from us all the time is we want to bring the next generation of developers into .NET, so we want to make .NET easier to adopt. Um, and so you should be able to just run a, a friggin' file. Like this, something like that, perhaps? Like this? Like that. So. In my app here, I have just app.cs, so I am in no way committing that the .NET team will ever do the thing that I just showed you. But <laughs> I hope one of the directionally, the, one of the things we're thinking about doing is as we continue to try to make the simple things feel simple, to go along with the complex things that we already know are greatly possible. You should be able to build a tiny little microservice that doesn't really do anything with a single file. When you want to teach somebody C Sharp, you should be able to say, open up VS Code, make a new thing called app.cs and type console.writeline in it. And that's all you need. You shouldn't have to say, go do .NET new and then make a new like five file project and I'll explain what all these five files are so that you can do console.writeline. We, we built .NET to build exchange servers and Active Directory, um, and so it's great for enterprise applications. We want to make it great for getting started as well. So we're trying to, you know, as you said, it's the term you use. You have a great term for this, Glenn. What's that? Um, how we, we start with the enterprise. You and have we, to, we have to make .NET scale down as well as it scales up. Yeah, it scales up today. We want to make it scale down. Yeah, and so that's some of the directional thinking. As you see, there's a rough prototype of being able to say .NET run app.cs. Today, that uses just a bunch of made-up stuff. Um, it might be a thing that we do. It might be a long time before we get there. It might be a short time. I'm hoping to make it happen. If you think that should happen, well, you should flood me with all of the after this with all of your uh, yes. We think that should happen, uh, and uh, that's all from us. Thank you for being patient for the extra couple of minutes that we spent over time. I appreciate. It. There's a clock there, by the way. That's why I'm pointing over there. It's flashing. It's been flashing big red letters. For zero, zero, minutes. zero. <laughs> Leave the stage. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much.